Sweet. Kia ora, everybody. So stoked here. We've managed to catch Ben Warren in amongst his busy schedule of a tour and catch him for half an hour or so to grab some gems off the man. Um, ben, what did you do on the weekend just been, mate? Oh, just uh, just relaxed up with the family. Uh, took the kids to the to the trampoline park, flip out, and uh, just hung out with the kids. Really, it was fun and uh, hot pools. And so, yeah, re- relaxed and uh, kind of restoration exercise um, without actually uh, without actually doing too much exercise. So it was it was it was good. It's been a big week. Spoke to about a thousand people last week. So um, yeah, it was a uh, yeah, pretty big week. Most most of the seminars usually go for about four hours from my end. So from seven, I don't usually get out to about 11 so um just kind of like putting some uh going easy putting some uh, energy back in the system it is and with uh speaking to a large amount of people do you feel pretty drained uh is it quite good to go insular for a weekend or a you- um yeah, I don't. The, the problem is, I don't feel drained. The problem is, I, I get so excited, I can't sleep. So, um, yeah, I, I, I just get so buzzed up. And so, I was just so buzzed up all week. I think one night last week, I slept like maybe two hours or three hours, literally because I, I was just, you know, thinking about all the people I'd spoken to. Uh, like, because like, they come up to me after the seminars, which I love, and then ask questions. So, I really get into what's actually going on in their life there and then. And uh, yeah, I can't help but then start thinking about them in the night. Going, oh, what about this? And they could be doing that. Yeah, and so I, I literally just get so uh, excited, and, and just about every night, well, no, every night, people come up to me, just come to the seminars, just to tell me they can like share their story, like, oh, two years ago I came to your seminar, and I had a, you know, I had a thyroid issue, and I've done this and that, and you know, my thyroid issues improved, and 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 yeah, they just want to share their stories, and so it just puts so much wind in your sails that that actually I, I have trouble coming down during the week, and so it's nice on the weekend to then just try and um, get back to some kind of normality around um, the nervous system yeah absolutely and before we touch on thyroids um, who has been Warren today for those who uh, have been living under a rock and in maybe oh. in, in, in another country who's been Warren who's me um, I, I'm, I'm just a guy kind of on a mission I suppose um, to to have people you know live uh, incredible lives to, to, to live the sort of life they want regarding energy I think you know I think we be pure we're trying to build the future of health and, and I think we're we're living into a, a world where where illness is going to be optional um, and 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 be pure we're, we're part of I guess we're part of that story part of that journey around really helping people create their future around health so I'm a clinical nutritionist by training a master's degree I'm, I'm clinical director of be pure so we've probably got New Zealand's largest natural health clinics so uh, we've got about, I don't know, about 20 plus practitioners clinicians um, yeah, so we do a lot of testing. We do a huge amount of testing. We own, we've got a laboratory in Hastings, which is a, a one of a kind in, in, in Australasia. Um, probably in what we're trying to deliver, one of a kind on the world. So, yeah, it's, it's um, fun times. Nice. I've been catching you getting very excited about that um, testing station that you got in. Oh, man, I love it. I love it. I get, in, I get in the lab. I get in the lab. And, I mean, it's great. You can pee in a pot and then run your own urine and have a look at what's going on. So, like, it's like I just I just almost want to start. You know, just pee, every, I don't want to waste my pee anymore. I want to, like, run it through the machine so I can see what's going on and then fine-tune stuff to have it uh, go even better. So, yeah, as you, as you can tell, it's, um, it's a bit exciting. Because when when I saw you last year um, in Cambridge at the Hormone Secret, was that right? Was that what it was called? Yeah. yeah. Um, you were saying that you guys were the biggest testers of urine and, and, and poop in Australasia. Um, yeah. So does that mean you guys are going to be putting it through the one spot then? <laughs> yeah, we um, yeah we we can't do stool samples yet. Um, hopefully, you know, probably about a year away from doing stool samples. The, the lab requirements to do a stool sample is obviously pretty pretty uh, yeah pretty serious. But yeah, for the urine stuff, it's it's um, it's yeah it's really fun. Nice. Now, so you touched on thyroid just then, and people solving their thyroid problem. Sure. There, last episode was with Adam Kavner, who um, was a shift worker got diagnosed with a thyroid issue and was kind of given the option of surgery and probably medication or medication. And he didn't really want to go down that path and found out that maybe gluten and in particular the paleo diet might help him. Sure enough, was yeah. bang. Uh, paleo diet, going gluten-free, helped him. Um, right. brought, up, brought up your name because I'd, I'd heard you talk about it. What is it about the gluten that, that mimics this thyroid and, and sets, it, sets it off one way or the other? 
Yeah, they, um, I don't know if they actually know the biochemical, um, you know, whether it is protein mimicking. I've got my own sort of hypothesis on that, but let me start off right by saying, Ryan, every case of underactive or overactive thyroid I've ever seen gluten has been a problem. And so, you know, we're, we're talking, you know, um, tens and tens of cases, maybe even, maybe even a hundred. And so, um, you know, every case I've ever seen gluten has been a problem. And so we don't know exactly, I, I don't know the exact reason why I have my own hypothesis and my own hypothesis is that, um, as, as, uh, the blood comes up through the thyroid, part of the role of the thyroid is also to kill pathogens because uh, iodine is a bacterial site. And so what starts happening is if your immune system has tagged the proteins as an invader, um, so tags gluten as an invader in the gut, uh, uh, and people have leaky gut syndrome, so these proteins are getting into the bloodstream, getting tagged as an invader, as they're coming up through the thyroid, um, it's sort of like the last ditch effort to stop pathogens from getting to your brain. And so uh, I, I think what's happening is the immune system's then attacking these tagged proteins in the thyroid, which is then causing a lot of autoimmunity within the thyroid. So you can measure this test through thyroid peroxidase, um, TPOs, and, um, and then that really leads to a lot of thyroid dysfunction. So that's sort of like the bio, biochemistry. So, you know, if, the, if there's some molecular mimicry going on with the protein and, and very similar to the, to the protein within the thyroid, that, that, which is essentially what you're pointing to, um, that, that could well be happening as well. So, um, but the interesting thing is, you know, for many, many people, um, and I mean, again, this is, this is correlational. We, you know, I'm not saying that this causes that in any way, shape or form, but we just see that when many people get gluten out of their diet, um, the thyroid tends to improve. Um, and so it, it's like, well, for me, it's like clin I'm a clinician first and foremost uh, and a scientist. And I'm like, well, let, let's, let's do what works and see if we can then figure out why later. <laughs> Absolutely, and I'll, I'll weigh myself in as another end for that um, leaky gut, gluten insensitivity, low thyroid function. Ah. Two months off, bang, back in, back in business. So um, There you go. There it is. Yeah, it's just, it's just so many times it happens. And um, I guess, you know, we're, we're really moving into a systems biology approach of how the body works now. And this is a very much a systems biology approach, whereas the traditional approach is isolated in the thyroid. And if you've got a problem in the thyroid, well, it's a problem in the thyroid. Well, you know, we're, we're really beginning to understand that the body does not work like that. It is a systems biology approach. You know, all the systems affect each other. Um, and, and, yeah, it's sort of trying to understand this and put it together is, is 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 a lot of fun right now absolutely and um any patient of mine that comes in with thyroid, thyroid issues and, and there's plenty of them i definitely retail that that tale that you said about um gluten sensitivity send them your way uh, give them the bpo well done well, thanks for that appreciate it. yeah i mean yeah, the, hopefully the, they follow it up <laughs> yeah well the, the research shows that it, you know it, it is inflammatory for everybody and and you know we know that low-grade inflammation is 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 is, is a real problem uh, for not only modern diseases but also for how we feel and so um yeah uh, my recommendation around gluten is, is if, if, if anyone has anything at all wrong with them, get off gluten. If they've got nothing at all wrong with them, I don't mind them. A little bit of gluten, just sometimes, but, but it is inflammatory for everybody, so you have to be careful. Nice. Um, so as I said, I, I saw you for the first time last year at Hormone Secret, and one of the things you were talking about was um, estrogen. And yeah. my, my partner has managed to sort of reverse her endometriosis by getting her estrogen back in check. It turned out in her case that it took three months of clearing away mold um, so that her liver could detox and rebalance, things like that. Well um, done. For you, what's, and this is a question I asked of Dr. Karen Zinn as well, what sort of exposure are you finding with mold in this country of, of some it's probably subnormal housing? <laughs> yeah, I think it's a massive... Um, like nobody's really talking about it and, and um, you are, which is great, but uh, you know, it's not really well known. I think it's a massive problem and I don't think we know the extent of the problem. We know there's a relationship between certain genes that get more, um, are more susceptible HLA genes that are much more susceptible uh, to mold exposure and the impacts of that. But I think, you know, as we go forward, we're going to start seeing more and more health issues coming through because of mold exposure and leaky homes. And so, yeah, I, I think it's very early days right now. Um, even testing for the mold, can be, you've probably been through this, it's probably very difficult um, right now. And, and so um, I think, 
yeah, it's it's a great great thing for people to be aware of. Um, but then again, you know, solve it. How did you guys solve it? Did you like move away from your home, or did you change home, or, or what did you do? Uh, lucky enough for us, it was previous mold exposures, and we, um, like I said, with the testing front, um, we both saw Dr. Steve Joe, who typically uses uh, integrative medicine and um, kinesiology to di- diagnose yep. it and also systems pro- um, symptoms profile and it was just a big course of, of charcoal away from food three times a day and thankfully, huh. thankfully that cleared it away and and it was interesting talking with Steve as his one week in general practice to maintain his general practice certificate he said to the 10 of the people we saw and eight of them had mold and that sure enough, his mate who he was filling in for came back and said, what did you do to those people? They're all better now. And he said, oh, they, had, they had mold. Yeah, and, and so it's, it's quite amazing. The, the other thing is, we, we touched on there is estrogen. Um, and the scary thing, you're talking about age of, of puberty in women, and I've just had a wee daughter. So um, yeah. what, what, are we, what are we sort of getting all these estrogens from and how are we able to better detox it, better better sure. it away? Yeah, they're every, I mean, obviously a woman's body makes natural estrogens, and um, but we now have these molecules in the environment that are called xenoestrogens, and so these 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 xenoestrogens are, are, are chemical molecules, but they they have the ability to sit on the estrogen receptor site and activate the receptor site as if estrogen is sitting there. So these are you know coming from a lot of places. They're coming from things like pesticides, herbicides. They're coming from um, a lot of plasticizers, so things like BPA. They're coming from skincare products like parabens, phylates. And so um, the, the first step is to really try and minimize our exposure to these as much as possible, you know, moving away from drink plastic drinking water bowls. Very basic thing, but, um, um, but you know, anything we do to minimize our exposure, for men and women, for women it's, 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 it's a problem, but actually a lot of the research is more around um, xenoestrogens on the male species, not necessarily um, male humans, um, but, but on, on the male species in general. Um, because of the, in the environment, a lot of these xenoestrogens are having major impacts on feminizing, feminizing um, like male alligators, for example. Um, so anyway, um, so then what can we do to, to help clear them? Now, fortunately, we've got a number of pathways within our livers to help clear these molecules out. And, um, and so we've really got to be eating particular foods that help support those pathways and, and the cruciferous vegetables are really the key so the cruciferous vegetables so these are your broccoli your cauliflower brussels sprouts cabbage kale capers watercress these kind of foods um and ideally eating lots and lots of them um and and there's also obviously some isolated nutritional supporting supplements one of them is called um, dim dolly methane which is dim which is uh, again very very beneficial for health clearing these molecules out and so um yeah so be sure you've got a daughter this is so it's just gonna be uh, you know we're the same way i've got two girls at seven and ten now and and uh yeah just trying to minimize their exposure to plastics through foods things like that just being aware if they're going to have a play with makeup make sure it's um, you know completely natural products within those makeups and then also um you know giving them plenty of these cruciferous vegetables to eat Oh, so just on the cruciferous vegetables, tell us about the vegetable forest that you've got at your place. Yeah, yeah. So we've got a food forest. So I've, I live on a 15-acre permaculture-designed organic nutrient-dense farm where we grow about 80% of the food we eat uh, at home. And so, yeah, I, I wanted to build a food forest, which um, basically so the girls can just wander along and, and pretty much, you know, there's just everything you can possibly grow in Hawke's Bay. We're growing from, you know, from avocados through to all your stone fruits, to, you know, apples, pears, berries, you know, raspberries, boys and berries. Uh, so, so I wanted to create this area, you know, like so you, you can literally just walk outside. There's obviously Fiji is happening right now, magic. And uh, so they can literally just go outside and if they're hungry, just go boom, off the tree, eat it. Best way to get our nutrition. So, um, you yeah, know, we're very, very lucky. Been there about 10 years now and uh, planted the trees, you know, most of them in the first few years. So they're beginning to really hit their straps and, and uh, produce an abundance, which is cool because then we can uh, supply veggie boxes to the team. Uh, to the BPS staff and stuff. So it's kind of like it really fits. Nice. Um, so with the, with the new talk, um, uh-huh. you're talking about energy and stress. And that was one of the secondary things that I had apart from mold was adrenal fatigue. Right. And, and I heard you talking to Lisa Tarmody about adrenal fatigue and she was quite sort of up in arms that, she went along to her GP and said, I'm feeling really down. I think I've got adrenal fatigue and got told that, I oh, know that's not a thing. Um, 
what is it about these subclinical conditions? One, yeah, why aren't they being recognised? And two, what sort of things should we be aware of, especially in the case of adrenal fatigue? Yeah, well, I mean, I think medically now they haven't recognised it. They're calling it HPA dysfunction, which is hypothalamus pituitary adrenal dysfunction, uh, which I still use the word adrenal fatigue just because people can relate to that a little bit more. Um, well, I think, you know, the reason people aren't, you know, these subclinical issues is, is, is really to do with the, the model that we have with, with health. The model is basically, you know, if you don't have a disease, you are healthy. And so, you know, it's black or white, either you've got a disease or you're healthy. Well, we actually know that's not how the body works. It's a spectrum of function. When you look at metabolic pathways, when you look at genetics, it's, it's, it's on a spectrum. And so, um, so you know, if, if you go in there and get some testing around your adrenal function and, and you don't have a disease, well, this is still good news, you know. But, but just because you don't have a disease doesn't mean it's working as well as it could or as well as it should. And so... Um, yeah, so you know, when you start looking around adrenal function, which is really associated with a fatigue that's not resolved by sleep, um, you know, these people are often not hungry in the morning, so you'd be familiar with these symptoms um, in the past. Um, you know, fatigue at three o'clock in the afternoon. And so, you know, some of the things we've got to be doing around that is, is really supporting the adrenal glands. Nutrition is the key, so key nutrients like magnesium, zinc, vitamin c all heavily required for adrenal function and we use a product called the adrenal regenerator which really is a glandular based product but this that, that really helps people it's like provides plug and play nutrition for the gland and um yeah and start rebuilding start rebuilding but the key the first thing with adrenal fatigue is to find what the the stressor was that caused it so like and I'm not sure whether it's in your case or your wife's case, but it was you know if it's mold is you know moving away from that exposure um and, but the thing is, anything can drive adrenal fatigue. It could be, this, you know, being a student and you're, you're working, you know, you, you're burning the candle at both ends. It could be that you've got, you know, a young business and you're just working too much. It could be you've just had, you know, three children in five years if you're a female. It could be just that you're, you know, you've got a crappy marriage. So there's going to be a lot of things that, that can drive adrenal fatigue. Um, and so it's really sort of finding the, finding the cause and, and then obviously fixing the cause and then rebuilding uh, the, the glandular function and the HPA axis. Nice. Yeah, it was it was that mild leaky gut, um, a concussion, yeah. and, and some surgery that, and probably on top right. of just a previous um, Epstein Barr virus. Right. Yeah. yeah. So no. And was, what happens is the system just gets on the floor, and the system just can't get up off the floor. And 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 it's not until you really come in and you know, put some serious inputs into the system that you then can like reboot it and start feeling kind of like how we should feel again, right? Absolutely. And and I know. Um, Toby Cunliffe, who's, who's a rower as well, he's, he's in, the, in the same boat of, of being burnt out and, and having to drop his training down. And, and the, as far as a high-performance athlete goes, I, I feel a struggle, not that I'm high-performance, but you know, you go, you go after it and get told, well, you need to keep your heart rate down and, and, and um, not, not blow yourself out. And that was, that was the biggest thing is how much it affected my heart rate. I'd, I'd just get to that point and it'd go off the rails. Um, yeah, whereabouts along the axis is that kicking in, and why can we only go so far without blowing out, if you will? Well, I think your you tolerance of stress. So this is with the HPA dysfunction. So that there's a, a adrenal cortotrophic hormone that comes from your pituitary, which really c controls a lot of your stress responses. And uh, I, 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 I think what's probably happening there is your, your ability to tolerate stress is, is that you're going okay, going okay, and then all of a sudden your body goes, you know what, this is a major stress, and, and just dumps a whole bunch of uh, adrenal cortotrophic hormone, which then releases a whole bunch of adrenaline, noradrenaline, epinephrine, which, which then gives you that, that high you know, like your body, your body can't differentiate between stresses. And so, you know, at that point there, your body is going, okay, I'm, I'm running away from a lion and I need to really run, otherwise I'm going to die. And so that just kind of, you know, that, that just really shows where your nervous system was at at that time. Um, whereas obviously you sort of like, well, no, actually I'm just running for fun. Um, <laughs> I don't really need that response. And you, your body's then probably going, well, why are you running? <laughs> <laughs> You should be you should be doing some yoga, or you should be like doing some diaphragmatic breathing and and, and relaxing, walking on the beach. <laughs> no, so I saw a, a good um, meme the other day, and it was a, a, a cheetah talking to a bear, saying, "What's what's that uh, um, Homo sapien running from or running after?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's good. No, it's good. So you said you've already done a few seminars already, and, and um, yeah, it excites you up. 
is there a commonality among, amongst this world? You know, as you said, uh, uh, um, autonomic nervous system doesn't realise just yet that we are in this nice, comfy world, yeah. and, and we keep yeah. firing off. Um, um, uh, um, is there any um, is there any commonalities coming through? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think you know um, when we look at sort of an evolutionary theory of our our bodies, how we've evolved, uh, you know, we're designed or evolved. Um, you know, some of the commonalities is our, our nervous system is really evolved for a different era than we're living in right now, and so it, it, it's kind of this fight or flight response can't differentiate between stresses. So you know, like you use the use the example of a bear or a lion running away from it. The trouble is, we, our bodies are running away from a bear or a lion like five six times a day, but it's not real. It's not really a real bear or lion. It's just you know what we have going on in our life. And then the, 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 another, there's an evolutionary theory around um, around one of the biggest chronic stresses that we had in, in getting here over time was a lack of lack of food, a lack of calories. And so you know we had a number of us, uh, and, and it's controlled a lot by genetic genetic factors. But uh, theoretically, there's this theory that that when we get stressed for for some of us who are genetically inclined our bodies go oh we're getting stressed it must be a lack of a lack of food and our bodies go into storage mode and so we go into being we basically go into lower our metabolism we get tired and we store and so we're seeing a lot of people who um, you know are gaining weight and are tired um from from stress from uh, and and then i'm finding it very very difficult to you know manage their weight because um because of the stresses in their life so you know talking about strategies of, of you know how do we get our bodies to cope better with these stresses how do we cope mentally better with these stresses and kind of like get our body kind of going no no it's okay there's you know there's plenty of food so that then you can start using the food that's stored on your, you know the, the energy that's stored on your body in fact for energy um, does that make sense? It's sort of like uh, absolutely, and I've got some questions on that. Questions on that. Yeah. Um, so stress so is glycolytic. Stress is glycolytic. And our storage hormones yeah, insulin. Storage hormones insulin. Yes. Is it that the glycolytic was insulin or cortisol drives? Okay, well, yeah, it's cortisol. So cortisol causes the glycolytic. So uh, cortisol causes gluconeogenesis, which which mobilizes glycogen from the liver. Um, it, it'll cause you to break down muscle mass to make sugar. Um, and so the, the cortisol basically gives you the stress response, and then your blood sugar levels go up, and then your body releases insulin in response to the blood sugar levels to drive it into the cells. And so, you know, now if you're exercising, if you are running away from a bear, your body will drive that those sugars into the muscle cells for you to run. But, but the trouble is most of us aren't running away from a bear. We're just sitting at our computer stressed about work. And so we're getting this physiological response, um, which is then causing the gates to open on the cells. And, and then, then, then the sugars, because high blood sugar levels are very damaging to your body. So if you're getting an appropriate insulin response, the insulin's then driving the sugar into your cells. So you're getting, you're getting storing body fat. And so you, essentially over time we do this and we, we start lo losing our muscle mass, gaining body fat. And so then our metabolic rate starts dropping because we've got less metabolically active tissue. Uh, and so then we gain more, more weight just from eating the same amount of food. Uh, and, and so we get into this real negative spin regarding our own metabolism. And so um, you kind of get into a towel spin regarding you because you're losing your muscle mass. Um, so yeah, I, I, for me, I think it's the cortisol that drives the, you know, the, the glycolytics and, and the glycolysis and, um, and then, and then that's driving insulin. Yeah. And from here, where does the ghrelin fit in? Yeah. I mean, ghrelin and leptin are you sort of like feel, uh, full hormones and then, uh, yeah, satiety hormones. So le leptin sort of like tied into our sense of satiety. Uh, the neat thing around that is that we know that the fat helps stimulate leptin. Uh, and so, you know, I, I definitely think that, you know, people are getting, you know, leptin and ghrelin sort of resistance to a degree, probably because of the amount of food we're eating. You know, there's just such an abundance of calories. And, and I think it, it's probably wise to, um, for these people, is to, you know, start looking at some intermittent fasting or some um, time-restricted eating practices where you maybe only eat for an eight-hour window so we can start retraining some of these uh, appropriate um, ghrelin and leptin responses so that um, yeah so that we can kind of get the sensitivity back to these hormones as well nice and that, so that's a tough ask for most people to front up and say we're going to restrict the time you eat or 
you're going to skip a meal even though you're hungry. What is yeah. some of the counselling that goes around that? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> we like, okay, so I, I think it's finding a way that works for the individual. So, um, you know, and this is, by the way, this is not a frontline approach that, that we use at BPO. We basically, this is, we, we try and use every other possible approach first. But if things aren't working, um, uh, and, and you have to make sure the thyroid is working really well to do this and things like that. So, um, but, but, but then it start looking at, you know, what works for the individual. And, and so f for me, I, 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 I play with this because um, I, I like the idea of, you know, the incredible research um, around anti-cancer and longevity of long-term calorie restriction and, and um, really turn, turning off um, these cellular pathways and mechanisms. So for me, it's just about finding what works for the individual. Um, and so for me, I, I have breakfast and then I have lunch and then I, I usually eat my last meal around four o'clock. Um, and so, so I'm getting sort of a good sort of 16 hour, um, and that really works for me. Um, I, other people I know, you know, not having breakfast works for them. I'm, I have concerns that by not eating breakfast, it's stimulating a cortisol response and, and kind of having a bit of a stress response. So I don't, I don't, uh, but it's about just finding what works for the individual. And, and I mean, with these kind of individuals, they're usually very motivated because, right, they've tried a lot of things to manage their weight and are struggling to manage their weight. And, and this is actually, a, it's actually you know, pretty achievable for most people. Um, you know, once, once they get into it and kind of get the feel for it, um, yeah, they, they, they tend to go pretty well. Nice. Um, so if someone was to go into the Be Pure program, what are sort of the steps in, in girth of, of how they can approach the health? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, the first thing we do, we, um, you know, we get a lot of history and, and a lot of uh, looking at trying to establish what is the right diet for you, because I believe that everyone's different. And, and so, you know, like the African tribesmen got 80% got of their calories from carbohydrates. And they did really well doing that very healthy, whereas the Inuit got 80% of their calories from fat and protein. And, and they were very healthy doing that. So we're going to find what is your right diet to stabilize your blood sugar level. So that's like one of the first things we look at establishing. We also then look at establishing key, key nutrient levels like vitamin D status, zinc status, making sure that you have a, you know, making sure that you're getting enough magnesium, enough selenium, enough trace minerals, enough macro minerals, enough B vitamins um, for your, for your, to meet your energy requirements on a daily need. Um, and then from there, we get into, into a lot of testing. So we're you know, very much into looking at cellular energy production. Are there any blockages in people's metabolisms to be able to burn fat as an energy source? So a lot of people, they do, they have blockages that they're not able to actually use fat as an energy source. So they have all this body fat, but they actually can't use it on the, for an energy source and they're tired. So, you know, look at these, unlocking these blockages um, and then start looking at, you know, obviously gut um, gut issues start looking at balancing hormones like progesterone and estrogen and normalizing these hormone levels so that people have um you know um, can feel better so, you know obviously that's primarily uh, for, for women and um and then looking at adrenal function uh, assessing adrenal function maybe doing some testing around the adrenals and then rebuilding and balancing um, people's stresses and again their nutrient requirements to meet their daily needs uh so that, that's sort of like a a, a very basic level that we do. And then we, from there we go deeper into um, genetics, stool testing, biome, and, 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 and that side. Nice. And if someone wants to access BPOA, do they have to be in Auckland or the Hawke's Bay or how can they go? No, no actually we've got a, a yeah, that's great. Well, thank you for the question. We, uh, yes, yeah, so we've got a, we've got an online clinic. We've got a, so basically uh, we can see anybody in, in New Zealand via Zoom. We have a, a platform or, and an app like a platform that you can do it through either your computer or your phone and then we have home test kits which are which are you know test kits that you just take home and complete the kit and send it back into the lab for the testing and so yeah people can do it anywhere that's awesome and i know um luke taylor in, in hamilton who we had early on in the podcast is is a big fan of being able to access your help um online yeah 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 luke's a machine <laughs> yeah, no yeah and i need to get him back after he did his iron man what a legend um, yeah so ben if people want to access uh your your show where do they go to and we'll have it in the show notes um what what's the the, the new tour called it and um and what sure. 
Yeah, it's called Tired, Stressed, and all the rest, and they can just go to Be Pure uh, Events, B E P U R E. I'm mean, actually your way. Uh, I think not next week, week after up in Cambridge is May May second. So um, yeah, so if any, any of your local followers want to come and learn how to really get more energy, how to manage stress, um, and start learning how to understand how we're all unique and individuals and then also how to take the guesswork out of what's going on in your body with scientific testing then come along magic and of course it's just be pure be been warm be pure be pure be more yeah yes yeah, so just yeah, if i do google like be pure um and the events page uh let me i, I can have a look right now this is the uh yeah so it's it's yeah it's it's a long url so probably just google be pure events ben warren or ben warren be pure events and uh yeah we're, we're, we're still got about about 20 towns to come to i think so i've just just kicked off the tour and so um yeah it's gonna come visit all these beautiful places around new zealand so i think we need to build that too magnificent as i said i'll have that in the notes um one last thing to leave people with ben what would you what would you like uh people to approach to their health journey with? Um, wow. Probably a sense of curiosity. <laughs> yeah. If, if, you know, if you can, if, if you've got a sense of curiosity about your health journey and like trying to understand what's going on in your body and why I, I don't, yeah, the body doesn't make a lot of mistakes, but it's quite incredible. And and so if you can start understanding what's going on and why, um, you start really being able to see that um, you can break through the limits of what you think is possible regarding what your body is capable of, whether that's athletic performance, whether that's um, energy production, whether that's how good you can feel. Um, so, but yeah, go into it with a sense of curiosity. Magnificent. Um, and I'll let you get away and hopefully you get to have a good sleep tonight, Ben. Yeah, all good. I'll probably get better sleep than you, Ryan, since you've got an eight-week-old. Eight so uh, enjoy that. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ben. Cheers. Cheers now.